Oh, cheese. I love your penis. Oh. I know this is a very, very long video, but it's because we're going to show you guys exactly step by step how to perfect what is definitely the most overlooked and underrated step in the entire publishing process and facts. And if you do watch this video and implement everything that we say, you will guaranteed make thousands of dollars extra in the long run from your publishing business. I guarantee it. What we're trying to say is this video is definitely worth watching, especially if you run AMS ads to your books. Especially. So what is this step in the process that we're talking about? It's obviously not a secret because it says in the title, right? It's your description of your book. And I think it's something that people don't talk enough about and they don't put much effort into. A lot of people just copy and paste some bullshit into the, the book description. People don't realize that your book description is the sales page for your book. Mm -hmm. So this lesson is actually from, it's a full lesson from the course. Can you please stop? <laughs> Sorry. It's a full lesson from AA 2.0 that we've been creating, holding nothing back, and it's everything you need to know to write the best selling book descriptions for your book. Is there anything else you want to say before we just show it? Let's run the clip. Let's run the entire lesson. I hope you guys enjoy. Fades of Black. What's up everyone and welcome to this lesson where we are going to be talking about how to write a book description that sells like crazy. We just talked about how important your book description is. Now this is going to be a long juicy lesson about how to actually get that done. Um, so we'll be talking about the structure of a best selling book description as well as how to nail every part of your book description. Yes, when you break it down and how to just deliver the best sales copy possible really there was too much in this lesson to write it all in this section yeah so we're just like we'll forget it yeah um we would like to start this lesson with a little disclaimer just letting you know this is going to be a very heavy and very detailed lesson so we just want to let you know that we don't want you to get overwhelmed okay you can watch back this lesson whenever you want watch it now you're not going to be writing your description now but when you do watch it uh, you could either print out the PDF below, which has all the the slides, um, or you can watch it back. Here, what we have to say, but definitely do watch this lesson back. When, but definitely do watch this lesson back when you are actually writing your description. This lesson does get quite advanced, but it's something anyone can learn and apply. Yeah, literally anyone. It just takes a little bit of time. Yeah. So this also goes beyond writing book descriptions. Take what you learn in this lesson beyond your book descriptions and you can apply it to future book titles and also outside of your publishing business. Copywriting is one of the most valuable skills to have in business. Which is all writing a book description is. It's copywriting. Yeah. Copywriting is just the written form of sales. Selling with words. Shall we get into it? Yes, let's begin. So let's start with talking a bit about background of our book descriptions. So your book description is going to be slightly different for your ebook your paperback book, and your audiobook. There are differences we have to accommodate for to make each book description the most highly optimized book description possible. Because the book description is so damn important and plays such a big role in converting an interested browser into a buyer. So this is why we are going to make those accommodations. Some small, some bigger, but there is a lesson about each of these ones mm -hmm. explaining the differences and what you're going to change so let's start with the fact that on kdp you are only allowed 4,000 characters well only allowed you are allowed 4,000 characters it's quite a lot yeah in your book description which is approximately 600 words and you want to use as much of those 4,000 characters as possible but of course that depends on your book if you have a short book about a simple topic such as i don't know Puppy training, in our example, is not the most complex topic. Uh, so our book description probably will not, will not be the full 4,000 characters, but maybe 3,000 characters, and that's okay. But the point is, your book description is not just supposed to be one paragraph and then buy this book. Mm -hmm. That's not what your book description looks like. It is, it's long. It's structured. There's psychology involved. There's copywriting involved. Um, and you want to use the real estate that you're allowed. Mm -hmm. So in general, longer is better, but 
the point is just to deliver the message. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then for Audible, you are only allowed 2,000 characters. Now, that's actually quite short, mm-hmm. only, which is approximately 300 words. Uh, but watch the lesson that is, comes later after this one uh, where we show you the changes to make so that you can accommodate your description that you've written for Audible. So let's move on. Now, all non-fiction book descriptions can be broken down into the same basic structure regardless of the niche. I like this. This is what I like, is how we break it down like this. Mm-hmm. Break it down into five sections. It makes it a lot easier to approach mm-hmm. and a lot easier to actually... It's, it's not as intimidating, like, oh, where the hell do I even begin? You begin with the headline. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Now, the main exception is bundles, but in the bundle module, we'll show you how to write descriptions for your bundles. Yeah. Um, so let's break it down. This is how your descriptions will start. Into that's five different sections. So it starts with your headline, followed by your story slash lead, then your bullet points, dealing with last minute objections, and finally your call to action. So we're going to go through every single step here, break it down. Give lots of detail on each one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we're saying don't get overwhelmed because mm-hmm. there is a lot of information in this lesson. But we just want to provide as much guidance as possible. Yeah. Now it says... This is a plug-and-play structure template. It really is. Which it is. Once you've figured out, like, the base of it or how it works in general, it's going to be much easier to write your descriptions from there on after. Yeah. But But learning it at first uh, takes time. Actually, what I also wanted to say in the disclaimer that I forgot is that uh, this is not easy. Mm -hmm. Writing a book description, a really good one, is not easy. Uh, So you can definitely outsource it. I would recommend for a lot of people to outsource it to a professional. We have a lesson about that, so I won't talk more about that. But back to the plug and play structure, yeah, every book description that you write will start with a headline and end with a call to action. Mm -hmm. Every single one, no wavering from that. So yeah, let's move on. So the first thing that your book description or that every book description will start with is your headline. And your headline is your most important part because it's the only part that appears above the fold. There's a picture of it right here. The fold is what you see without having to click the read more button. So we have red arrows here pointing to this book description's headline. Uh, It's like that. Again, we will be teaching formatting in a future lesson. Uh, But what's so important about this is because it is the part of the description that will grab all the attention. Everyone will see it. You can't not see it. Okay. So it is super important to have something captivating and compelling but we'll get into that. So the headline has one job and one job only, and that is to make the reader click the read more button and read the next line. That's it. That is the only thing you want to accomplish with your headline. That's the only thing you have to keep in mind. I love breaking things down that simply, mm-hmm. okay? Because that really is all we want from this. You don't have to prove anything in the headline. You don't have to teach anything. Nope. Just make them click the read more button. Just get them interested. Mm-hmm. Make them want to read more. So a common mistake that publishers make is that they try to sell their book in the headline. Yeah. Having huge claims and benefits in the headline and pushing for the sale too soon. Something like, buy this book if you want to get rich tomorrow. Yeah. That was a very extreme example, but things like that. People can, will sometimes start a headline with, buy this book, uh-huh. or here's why you should buy. Uh-huh. Trying to trying to force a sale down your throat. Yeah, this turns customers off because you're pushing for the sale too quickly. And everyone hates a pushy salesman right off the bat. Yeah. There's nothing worse. I'll give an example. Have you ever walked like down a market and then you're just looking at booths? They're just selling random trinkets. We uh, live in Southeast Asia, so yeah. we see it a lot. <laughs> yeah. So they're just selling bracelets or sunglasses. And like, I want a bracelet or I want sunglasses. But I walk up, start looking at the sunglasses. And then he comes up like, special price for you, special price here, uh, blah, 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 blah. Start giving me all kinds of crazy stuff. And it will literally turn me from interested, I need his sunglasses, to no, I'm literally walking away. I don't want to deal with you. Because you're trying to force it on me like yeah, that. Like, uh, that's a very uncomfortable feeling. So they will literally become not interested yeah. with a pushy a pushy salesman, and the equivalent would be a headline where you try to sell it. Yeah. Right? They won't want to hear what you want to say, and they won't click that read more button, and that's yeah. all you want to happen. Yeah. So there are a few different ways you can structure a headline. Specifically, we have four that are the most effective headlines. We're going to give examples of every single one. Let's first name what they are. First is an if-then statement. 
Number two is using questions. Number three is how to, even if statement. And number four is a BuzzFeed headline. So all four kinds of headlines are very effective. It gives you a few options, so not all of your book descriptions are the exact same. Exactly. We could just have left with one, like start each one with an if-then statement. Mm -hmm. But then all descriptions would look very similar. So here are four options that you can all take in many different directions. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's really about having options so that you could create a book description that you like. So let's show how, or let's talk about how we can create each single headline. Yeah, so the first one is the if-then statement. This is probably the most simple kind of headline. Very, very simple structure. Again, even the headline is plug and play. Mm -hmm. So an if-then statement looks like, if you want to, then you insert a benefit that applies to your book and your niche, dot, 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 then keep reading. Now those three words, just then keep reading, very simple, very unexciting, but it works, and it works because you're telling the reader exactly what you want them to do. To like, read more. The point of the headline is to get them to read more, so so you're just telling them that. And it's very easy. You're not asking for a lot. Asking someone to keep reading is a small favor, favor that you're asking of them. It, that's not a favor, but it's a small action that you're asking from them. So they'll do it. So this is one of those very simple, extremely simple, but extremely effective headlines. So I'm a big fan of this one. Now, effective copywriting doesn't need to be exciting. In this case, it isn't really, or complicated. The if-then statement certainly is not complicated either. It just needs to work, which this does. The if-then statement works, so don't complicate it anymore. You don't need to make it clever or catchy. So this is like the... uh, that. This is like the simple but effective one. Mm-hmm. So you could just use this one for all your headlines if you so choose. Yeah. Now, an example of if then headlines would be something like this. So for the weight loss niche, if you want to, and then benefit, lose up to 10 pounds in two weeks, then keep reading. Boom. So easy, so simple, so effective. For the business and money niche, if you want to make 10% a year in the stock market, then keep reading. Yeah. So in the brackets is, of course, the benefit that we mentioned. Um, It addresses the reader directly with a benefit that they want from your book, then ask them to take action, which is a simple keep reading. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple and it works for every single niche. That's the good thing. It works for any niche. Mm -hmm. Now, the next kind of headline that we're going to talk about is a question headline. With a question headline, you simply address your reader directly with a question. Now, asking a question is extremely effective as well. Because humans are neurologically programmed to answer questions that are relevant to them. Again, it will only work if you ask a relevant question. And what you want to do with the question is play on problems that your reader has. If you don't know exactly what we mean by that, let's get into the examples. Now, some questions are better to ask than others. Let's give examples of an okay, a better, and a best question to ask in a headline. So we're going to use the weight loss niche as an example again. So an okay question, really a bad question would be, do you want to lose weight? It's it's bad when you compare it to the best. Yeah. But it's better than the uh, headline we mentioned before. It's like, like, buy this book if you want to lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. Just do you want to lose weight? You're not making any crazy claims. You're not telling them why they should buy your book. Do you want to lose weight? They're like, yeah, I want to lose weight. So they're going to click the read more. Mm-hmm. But it's too broad and it's the answer is too obvious. Yeah. Right, so a, a better example is, do you want to lose weight quickly? Okay, it's a little more specific, better. but still not specific enough and not detailed enough. So the best um, question to put in a headline with this example would be, do you want to lose weight quickly while still eating, sorry, while still enjoying your favorite foods? Yes. Yes, I do. Now, this dispels objections, which is, oh, I can lose weight, but I can't eat my favorite foods anymore. Yeah. And addresses their fears, which is a, which is also, I can't enjoy my favorite foods. Yeah. Now, make sure that the response is positive, which is yes, yes. Yeah, make sure the answer to the question is always yes. Mm-hmm. And this will make them click the read more button. Mm-hmm. Now, the next uh, way to write a headline the is third the third one is the how to even if headline, this is a little bit more complicated, but extremely effective. So here's how it goes. How to get end result without common sacrifice, even if common objection. Yeah. So an objection is a reason to disagree or refuse or not buy. I think the best way to describe it is 
it's someone's reason to not buy your thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's what they're thinking in their head, the reason why I'm not going to buy it. Yeah. Now, here's an example that we came up with, how to lose weight, which is an end result that they want, without exercise, which is a common sacrifice. And even if, there's a common objection, even if you failed at every other diet in your life. Yeah. Now, I want to read it all together. How to lose weight without exercise, even if you failed at every other diet in your life. Now, the common objection part of it is very powerful because they're thinking in their head, yeah, okay, I want to lose weight, oh, I don't want to exercise, but... I've heard this shit before, and I fail every time. I've already tried it. I fail it every time I try and dieting. So you just acknowledge and address their objection, saying this can work even if you've never had success with dieting before. Mm -hmm. So just a very powerful headline. Yeah. Now the fourth kind of headline that you can use is something that we call a BuzzFeed headline. This is a shocking and provocative headline. It catches curiosity. It can include shocking numbers, facts, and statistics. Here's an example. Three-fourths, how do you say it? Three-quarters. Three-quarters of Americans are likely to be overweight by the year 2020. Holy shit. That's very shocking. 75% by 2020. That's the next year. Yeah. Well, when you're watching this, keep reading to make sure you don't become one of them. Keep reading. Yeah. Again, the point of all these four headlines is to have someone to just continue reading everything else you have to say. Mm -hmm. So to show you more what a BuzzFeed headline looks like, let's actually have a look at BuzzFeed.com. If you know what BuzzFeed is, BuzzFeed is basically a news outlet. And they're just known for having extremely shocking and provocative headlines. They have some of the best copywriters writing this stuff. Yeah. Um, So here, let's look at this first one. 18 times gay Twitter. What? Oh, 18 times gay Twitter was bonkers and hysterical. What? What's even... What bonkers is, and hysterical. I love those adjectives. Words, but w- that's crazy. Mm. So, uh, next one. 29 ways to make spring suck less. Like, I'll be honest. I'm genuinely curious. So, I'm, I just want to see what they have to say. Master the art of layering. Okay, fair. Now it sucks less. Okay. Okay, I lost interest. But, yeah. But um, the headline made you... Get yeah. interested. Okay, okay, this one, this one, this one. Carefully select a dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme and we'll tell you your exact birth month. What? What the hell are you talking about? How is that right? possible? No, but it's super, it's just attention grabbing. So if I choose 12 donuts, can we try this real quick? We'll do this later. Okay, I'm going to do this another time. Okay. But choose 12 donuts and they could guess my birth year. Yeah. Okay. But as you saw as an example, how shocking... Um, provocative and attention grabbing those titles were. Yeah, it, it makes you want to learn more. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. In this case, read more. Mm-hmm. Moving on to the next part of your book description. After your headline. After your headline. See, your headline is done. You don't have to worry about your headline ever again. Okay. Your headline is just one sentence, basically. It can be two, but like one sentence for the most part. Um, and the next section out of the five that make up a great book description is your story slash lead. And to be completely honest, I think this can be the most tricky section because there are so many ways to go depending on your book. It's just you can't provide as much handheld guidance in this one because uh, there's so much variance between every book and every niche. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways to go about it, so many approaches, so many directions. So yeah, you said it's the most tricky, but... That's not a bad thing because it's not the most important. The headline yeah. and the bullet points yeah, it's, are the most important it's, parts. It, it's not the most important. Mm-hmm. But like you said, the headline and the bullet points are the most important. I think we talk about this later. Mm-hmm. Um, because someone can easily read only the headline and only the bullet point. And be like, sold. Yes, Give me. The exactly. Next book. So if that helps take some pressure off of this part, there you go. I hope it does. Because it can be a little tricky. That's at least what I personally struggle with the most. Mm-hmm. And probably why I like to outsource my book descriptions. Because I'm not the best writer. Anyway. Now, what you want to do in this section is ease your reader into the description. Open them up and get them interested in what you have to say. Start with something interesting about your niche. Or you could also tell a little story because people... Love stories. All caps love stories. That's true. Now, again, a common mistake that publishers make here is that they make giant claims too early. Just yeah. Even too early. Just never make two giant claims. Okay, yeah. Don't make giant claims ever. <laughs> Only We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly too early to be making claims right now about what this book can do for you. You're not, you don't want to sell 
your readers yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is the biggest turnoff because the guard is still up. They still they still need to be convinced. Like, can I trust you? That's that's just how sales work. Mm -hmm. Everyone is skeptical in the beginning and is not ready to buy right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. People need to be warmed up. Mm -hmm. That is how all sales work. Now the purpose of your story slash lead is two things. One is to build trust. And the other is to establish credibility, which will in turn also build trust. Yes. Right? So how do you build trust? People buy from people that they trust. You don't trust someone who is trying to sell you something right from the get-go. So don't try to sell them anything yet. Yeah. Right? Again, there's so much psychology involved here. So just follow what's taught in this lesson. Mm -hmm. So you need to build trust first. Now, how do you do that? You can build trust by focusing on the problems before the solutions. Focusing, yeah, focus on the problems that they have and not trying to provide the solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, don't tell them about how your book will provide every solution that they need. Show them that you understand the problems they are going through. That's how, that's how they're going to trust you. They're going to be like, oh, they, they, they feel me. They, oh, they know what I'm talking yeah. about. They they're understand. Not trying, they're not, not just trying to tell me something. They fucking get me. They're not just trying to sell me. Yeah. They're not just trying to sell. They understand what I'm going through, and what I need help with. Mm. So state your reader's problems and be specific rather than vague. That's why instead of do you want to lose weight, mm -hmm. then do you want to lose weight quickly while still being able to enjoy your favorite foods? Yes, that's certainly a lot more intriguing and interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, when people can see that you understand their problems, this is like we just said, they will automatically think that you have the solution. Yeah. This part helps to lower the reader's guard and open themselves up to hearing about your solution. Yeah. They will become receptive to what you have to say and what you are selling. So this is what makes this story slash lead part of your description important mm -hmm. because they're just opening themselves up to being sold to. Yeah. So when you actually provide them how you can help them, they're they're listening and they're like, cool. Like great. when you first meet someone, you're like, no, I don't want to buy. I don't want. I don't want to buy. And then. As you, you become friends with them, a little bit like, okay, I'm willing. Okay, yeah. tell me, tell me what you're offering. Exactly. So the second objective with your story slash lead is establishing credibility, and one way to do that is using customer language. So it's very important that you use the language and vocabulary of your readers. So you need to know who you're talking to. This demonstrates credibility because when you speak in their language. You show that you know about this topic. You know what you're talking about. You know what they're looking for. Now, an example of you know using language depending on your audience. Let's use men and women as an example. In the weight loss niche, women want to be toned, but men want to be, get shredded. Right. So if you if your book is for women, you would never use the word shredded. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be shredded. They're gonna be like, what are you even talking about? Like, no, I'm not trying to be shredded. Mm -hmm. No. They want to be toned though, mm -hmm. but if you're making a book for men about how to get six pack abs, you would use shredded because men don't want to be toned. Ew, they want to be no. shredded. They want to have bulging muscles everywhere. So women want to be Victoria's Secret models while men want to be muscle machines. Yeah. So right? this is just an example of knowing who you're talking to. So know your target audience and talk to them in the way that is most receptive for them. Now, another example, what would be the right kind of vocabulary to use in the investing niche would be something like assets, capital gain, dividends, equity, securities, interest, yield. These are all investing, investing terms. terms. Yeah. Now, the wrong kind of vocabulary to use in the investing niche would be something like this. Make money, even though everyone wants to make money. That's mm -hmm. not the right terminology. Make money, get rich, financial freedom. That's not how you talk to an investor. Now, there is a different kind of audience that that does appeal to. But, right? not but not investors. investors. Right. Now, another way of establishing credibility is by providing a quote from an authority figure. Now, here's an example. The Mediterranean diet is a really nice example of the potential to love food that loves you back. Nothing special about this quote. The, the quote isn't really the important part here, but it's written by or it comes from Dr. David L. Katz, the founding director of Yale's University Prevention Research this Center. This dude's opinion matters. This dude's opinion matters. And what he says is right. And since we are quoting him in our book, then we must also know what we're talking about. Yeah, we are associated with this figure of authority. Mm -hmm. If you're quoting someone who knows what they're talking about, then we themselves, we will know what we're talking about. It's one of the best ways of establishing credibility. Yeah. Now, another way of establishing credibility is by using facts, statistics, and numbers. You're, you, you're showing that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. 
So, another example. According to the CDC National Center of Health Statistics, 39.8% of American adults are obese. We're using a fact and statistics and numbers in this one. So this sentence tells the reader that I've done my research and I know what I'm talking about. Huge. Now, if I, if I say the fact here, I know what I'm talking about, they're going to think in their head that that applies to everything in the book. Yeah, now you as a whole are put on a pedestal. So you are now credible. Mm-hmm. I want to listen to you. I want to learn from you. I want to eventually buy your book. Mm-hmm. Now, also be sure to credit highly credible sources and official sources, similar to the last point. Mm -hmm. Um, And here we're quoting the CDC National Center for Health Statistics. Like, no one will argue that what you're saying is not true. Exactly. If you just say the 39.8% of Americans are obese, like, okay, that's interesting. I need to lose weight because I don't want to be that. Mm -hmm. But the power in this quote is the according to the CDC National Center for Health Statistics. Also, keep this in mind. 39.8% is so much more powerful than 40%. Yes, it is. Is it 40% of Americans? It's, it sounds like you probably made it up. Yeah. Right? But 39.8, like, wow, they did their research. That like, this, came, is, this is specific. That came from, like, a research lab. Yeah. That yeah. is incredibly specific. Mm-hmm. Now, building trust and establishing credibility is how you're going to build the rapport that you want with your readers. Which is the entire purpose of this section of your book description. To build a rapport, make friends with them, make them trust you, and make them look up to you. Look Mm -hmm. up to your knowledge on this subject. Mm -hmm. We have covered the first two points, or the first two sections of your description, which is your headline and your story slash lead. Now the third section is your bullet points. This is the fun one. Yeah. So the second most important part after your headline. It could arguably could be the most important, but yeah. So this is where you pack in the benefits of your book. Someone might buy because there's one single bullet point that really resonates with them. Mm-hmm. right? So a common mistake that publishers make here is giving away the solution in the book description. Do not give away the content of the book before they buy the book. Mm-hmm. You the have pa- to keep them curious. The power is making them want to buy your book. Mm-hmm. Now, examples of what not to do with a book about weight loss, for example, in your bullet points would be saying, this is paraphrasing, saying something like, use intermittent fasting, go on the keto diet, do portion control. This makes no sense as bullet points Mm -hmm. because this is not going to sell your book. So in this case, the reader now has all the answers they need. They can simply just go and Google the rest. They don't need your book. The point is to sell your book. They don't need your book anymore if you're just telling them all the answers like that. Mm -hmm. So the bullet points is your opportunity to sell. Do a lot of selling in a short amount of words. You've already broken them down. Their guard is down and now they're willing to be sold to. Yeah. If you effectively wrote your story slash lead. Yeah. Now people love to read bullet points and they might even only read your headline and your bullet points. I say I probably do that often. I, I, oh, for me, 100%. Yeah. I'm just scrolling straight into the bullet points. Like what's what's in it for me what's in this book? a lot of us are super ADD yeah. so we just want to see the things that stand out yeah um, so how are you going to want to start your bullet points is using this or this is how you introduce them very simple it'll be in this book you will discover or in book title you will discover the reason why we use the word discover it's just a synonym for learn but people don't like to learn they want to discover it's much more enticing learn makes it sound like you're in school like, like oh god this is like a freaking a research paper, an Ugh. essay that I have to read. What a chore. Uh, never mind then. No, you want to discover new things. Again, this this is just in-depth copywriting things that we're showing you guys. So tell readers what to do, not how to do it. Give away a taste of what is inside the book. Think of this as samples of cheese at the supermarket. Yeah. Don't just give them a whole cheese roll or whatever you call them, a if, wheel. If you give them the whole block of cheese... They don't need any more cheese, so they're not going to buy their own block of wheel. Wheel of cheese. Their own wheel of cheese. Because they don't need it anymore. But if you have three samples, three really, like a really great cheddar cheese, Mm -hmm. great mozzarella, a great ricotta, like, okay, I want more cheese, so they're going to buy your wheel. That's obviously an analogy, but um, the same things apply. Yeah. So you want to spike curiosity. Curiosity is the most powerful selling emotion. Effective sales copy evokes curiosity. Convey that your book is full of secrets and shortcuts. Secrets is one of my favorite copywriting words. Yeah, secrets that they will never know unless they buy the book. I mean, once you're curious about something, you can't stop thinking about it until you have that curiosity 
taken care of. Shit, I mean, if I'm reading a book title or a book description, I'm like, what does this one point mean? Just let me, I'm just gonna spend the three bucks just so I can go inside and find out, like, okay, that's what I meant. I mean, that's, satisfied. that's exactly what happened with me right there on the BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. Like, pick 12 donuts and we'll tell you what month you were born in. Should like, I'm for dying to. to figure out if this is it gonna work. Like, mm -hmm. the tab is still open. I'm going to do that when this lesson is done. Mm -hmm. And that's just all because of curiosity. Now we just want to show you a few examples of bullet points to use and ones and not to use. So these are examples of where you're telling the reader exactly how to get the thing they're looking for versus telling them what is in the book that will get them the result that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And then also adding flavor and making things interesting and using language that it's like, I... I this is interesting to read. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying reading this description. So it's just all about making the reader need to learn more about your bullet points. You're just, each, the point of every bullet point is to be like, okay, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Yeah. Okay. So how to lose weight by eating cabbage. You're like, oh, okay. Thank you. I mean, it uh, was helpful. I eat cabbage by losing weight. It was helpful. The reader will appreciate it, but it's not going to make them buy your book. Now, the one green vegetable you should eat to lose up to four pounds per week. This is the like the best curiosity peaking example. I wrote this, and I want someone to tell me what that one green vegetable is. Mm -hmm. Is it is it cabbage? Mm -hmm. Is it spinach? Next example here: Why Stellar Lumens is the next 100x cryptocurrency? You okay, know what? You're telling you're telling them the answer. There. So this is in the crypto niche. What I'm gonna do there? I'm like, okay, I'm gonna Google search Stellar Lumens. I'm gonna find out. Okay, that is a good crypto. Then I'm gonna go and buy some Stellar Lumens. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not gonna buy your book. You're not giving them a reason to buy your book now because you just told them it's Stellar Lumens. Yeah. So how you do want to approach this would be something like, this coin currently trading at less than one dollar has the potential to become the next Bitcoin. Like, Ooh. like okay, like, tell me. Oh, okay. like you gonna stop there? What the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. Tell me what coin this is. Mm -hmm. Now the next example, why you should use the word you in a lot of book descriptions. Okay, all right. But how about this? The single most powerful word you can use in your book descriptions to produce an avalanche of sales. Hint, it's not free. The word is not free. That's what they're thinking. Like, oh, it's the word free. Yeah, uh, smart mm -hmm. guy. Avalanche of sales. That's like, that's amazingly uh, descriptive. And I can imagine in my head. Uh, that's just a great way of describing it. That that might be my favorite bullet point out of all of these. Mm -hmm. Actually, all four of the check marks are all very good. Mm hmm but yeah, uh, this final example, um, it, it's a little bit of a random one, but why you should never paint your home bright colors. Let's say it's in the homeware niche. A better way to say that and sell your book would be why adding improvements can actually lower the value of your house. Like wh what? Like it, curious. I'm curious. How does that make sense? Uh -huh. Making better is worse. Uh -huh. That doesn't make sense to me. I need to buy a book to figure out what the hell you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So final thing about bullet points is that you're going to want a minimum of seven bullet points. People read bullet points. So you want to give them boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. If you layer like seven pieces of curiosity on top of each other, like, well, I have seven reasons to buy this book. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity to sell and go crazy. And your first and last bullet point should be your best-selling or favorite ones simply because those are the ones that are most likely to be read uh -huh. that that's the only reason why uh -huh. and if you choose to use bold in your bullet points use them on your more powerful bullet points as well just to get the eyeballs on that yeah so uh the formatting lesson which is very in-depth is all about that like the formatting it's not just as important as the written words but you could argue that it's damn close mm -hmm. formatting is super important so that you make people read what you want them to read now, this is section four of five of your book description. We covered the headline. We covered the story slash lead and the bullet points. Next after that is dealing with last minute objections. Now we're getting towards the end of it. An objection is a reason for someone to disagree, refuse, or not buy. It's reasons that someone won't buy your book. Yeah. Right? So even after reading your bullet points, many readers will still have objections. The goal here is to address them, deal with them, and get rid of these objections that are stopping people from buying. Yeah. So three of the most common objections that people have from buying your book. Number one, is this true? Number two, does this person know what they're talking about? And three, will the information in this book work for me? 
right? So let's deal with all three of these common objections. Yeah. So this first one, is it true? This one is pretty easy to overcome. How you're going to make your reader know that everything you're saying is true is simply by making everything that you say believable and realistic. So where people would go wrong with this is by saying something crazy and insane. Lose 250 pounds in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not believable. That's not realistic. And they're not going to trust you. They're going to be like, okay, this book, it's clearly, ju they just want me to buy. Okay. So some people believe that like a bigger and crazier claim is better. Like this book said how to lose 10 pounds in a week. Oh yeah. I'm going to say how to lose 15 pounds in a week. Yeah. So you don't want to take it too far. So a bigger and crazier claim is not always better. It might actually be worse if it becomes unrealistic. But if you make completely reasonable claims, there's no reason to think you can't deliver on what you're saying. There's no reason to think that anything you're saying isn't true. So it's just like, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's possible. From what I know, yeah. You only ever want to make honest and reasonable claims that your book content can back up or else they won't trust you. And people will feel misled and leave a bad review. Mm -hmm. You don't want that. Don't tell people that you will get the results that just aren't possible. No, because I see it. This is this is not just like, this is something that people do. Mm -hmm. Like in a cryptocurrency book, I'll show you how to make 10 extra money in 30 days yeah. by buying this coin. Like that's just not true. And then when someone reads it and that's not what they're going to get, they're going to be mad because they feel misled and they're going to leave a bad review. But like this book was a scam. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge mistake that people make in sales. They think that, bigger, more exaggerated claim will make people buy more. That's not true. It won't. If it's too big, people won't trust you and you won't buy it all. We've basically already said this. Yeah. So spammy ship books have exaggerated and illegitimate claims. Yeah. You said this as well. Yeah. Right. So the next objection, how do we deal with, does this person know what they're talking about? This objection is easy to overcome with selling your ebook because you are selling a low priced item, which is just a 299 ebook. You don't need to be Warren Buffett to sell a two ninety nine ebook about getting started with investing. Yeah, but this is definitely more important for selling your paperback book, which you, is going to be your most high priced item or product that you sell. Yeah, you do want to assert credibility of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now you can do this by demonstrating and proving the claims that you've made by showing results. Yeah. So maybe earlier in your description you provided claims. But then after the bullet points, you're going to prove the claims by showing results. Mm -hmm. Use real life numbers like the actual return that people have made in, by investing in stocks. Yeah. Or you can use scientific studies to prove claims and make them into facts. Tangible evidence is key in demonstrating credibility. So this is just more demonstrating credibility. Mm -hmm. People need credibility. Yes. So an example of this in the weight loss niche would be something like studies have proven to show that People on this diet are losing an average of 17% more weight than people on the ketogenic diet. Yeah. Example, in, in the investing niche, in 2018, people made an average of 3.2% capital gains in the stock market. Proof that the claims that you've made are true. Now, the third and biggest objection that readers might have is the information in this book won't work for me. So this is the strongest and oftentimes the most difficult objection that needs to be overcome. This objection stems from a place of, I can't do it. This is a personal thing mm -hmm. that people have. Yeah. So people can know that your product works for the people and that you know what you're talking about. Like yeah. those are like, okay, yes, yeah, I exactly. believe it. They've, been, they've seen it. You've yeah. shown facts, you've shown statistics, you've shown authority, you've shown results, you've shown everything. But... They think I'm different. Yeah, exactly. It won't work for me. I'm different. Can I get the results? But can I get results? Tell them that yes, even they can get the results. But if they don't think that it will work for them, they still won't buy. Yeah. You need to convince the reader that this will work for them personally. Personally. Address the biggest reason why your reader thinks it won't work for them. So you need to figure out what is the biggest reason why your readers are skeptical that your book will work for them. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who is interested in buying and this will vary from book to book. Yeah. There's no, not like with the headline, which is very easy copy paste. Yeah. This is not like that. Th this would require some customer research or as simple as just putting yourself in the shoes of someone buying your book. Yeah. But we're going to give you examples so you know exactly what we mean. Then yeah. this will make much more sense. Um, so here are examples of the biggest reasons why your reader will think that your book won't work for them. So in the weight loss niche, 
They think this won't work for me because I failed at every other diet I've ever tried because of me. Exactly. Me, I'm the problem, so it won't work for exactly. me. Exactly. They know that the keto diet, the paleo diet, they know that they work, but it doesn't work for me because I've tried 10 and I suck. So you need to tell them, even if you suck and you've failed at every diet, this one can still work for you. Yeah. Now, an example in the guitar niche, this won't work for me because I've never even picked up a guitar before. Everything works but they've picked up a guitar before at the very least. Exactly. Your book is called Guitar F- Guitars for Beginners. So beginners can learn it. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not a beginner. Like, I've never even touched a guitar before. Mm-hmm. All these other people you're talking about with all the results, they've at least, like, they maybe have a brother who plays guitar and they have some affiliation with guitars. Mm-hmm. But I have nothing. Mm-hmm. Can it still work for me? Let them know, yeah, it'll still work for you. Now, an example in the investing niche, this won't work for me because I literally have no money. That That's a, that's a good one. Yeah. And, and an example in the dating niche, this won't work for me because I'm ugly. Like, all the dating stuff, this is great, but I'm fucking ugly. Girls still won't talk to me. Yeah. And so you need to address that objection that they have. Back to the investing one. Pe- broke people think they can't make money with investing. Let them know, yes, you mm-hmm. can. Now, on the next slide, we're going to show you how to overcome each of these objections. Um, in the programming niche, last one, this won't work for me because programming is complicated and I don't have any technical or computer skills. Now, how do we overcome each of these? So an extreme even if statement is amazing for addressing and dismissing this objection. Extreme, but still completely legitimate and realistic. Yeah, that could seem contradicting to what we were saying before by making realistic claims. That still applies, but you're you're pushing the edge maybe. So you deal with that objection by saying something like this. So with the example of the diet one that we gave, this diet is so easy to follow. You will have success with it even if you failed at every other diet in your life. So this is what you say to them once you know that this is their objection. This Mm -hmm. is what's stopping them. So you tell them straight to their face, this will still work Mm -hmm. even though you failed a bunch of times before. Now, you can learn how to play guitar in just 10 days, even if you've never picked up a guitar in your life. Mm-hmm. Again, if 10 days is not realistic, make it 21 days. Mm-hmm. It's important that it's realistic as well. Mm-hmm. But if you can learn in 10 days, then boom, 10 yeah. days. Next example, you can start building an investment portfolio even if you literally have no money. I mean, you can see that it's not that complicated making... Dismissing op- these objections. Dismissing these objections. Yeah. And the last example here... You can become a certified panty dropper even if your mirror cracks every time you look at it. That one's just funny. With regards to the one that they think, oh, I'm ugly, therefore I can't pick up chicks. You're basically talking right to their face and being like, no, stop not believing yourself. Stop thinking that you have a reason to not be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So you can do this. Let me help you. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's not that hard to overcome with these even if statements. Yeah. So even if statements are great, but you can also just address the reader's objections head on, kind of like what I was saying before, but you can make it even more direct, like in the investing niche. Even a broke teenager can start investing today. You're basically saying you have no excuses. Mm -hmm. You have no excuses to not get started and not buy this book. Mm -hmm. For the programming niche, you would say something like, so simple that your grandma could do it. Again, you have no excuses. Okay, so make them think if they can do it, if a grandma can do it or a broke teenager can do it, then so can you. And again, give extremes. Those extremes are the most powerful. Now, again, you don't want to be too extreme, but these are not. So someone that your grandma could do it. There are grandmas out there that can do it. That's realistic. Exactly. That is realistic. Is it extreme? It's definitely extreme. But there are grandmas that can learn some basic programming. Mm hmm. And that is how you deal with and overcome last minute objections. Now the reader, like I was saying, has no reason not to buy. You have no reason. You have no excuses. Mm -hmm. So the final part of your book description. This is the most fun one. This is my favorite. Because it's so easy. Yeah. It's so easy. That's a call to action. So the CTA, aka call to action, is the easiest step. You just ask for the sale. All the work has been done. You just need to tell them what to do, which is to buy your book. Mm -hmm. Tell the customer exactly what you want them to do. Like, exactly. Use the exact language of Amazon. Word for word, tell them this. If you want to provide a big benefit, then scroll up and click the Add to Cart button. Boom. Call to action done. Complete description over. Mm -hmm. Now, Add to Cart is a better call to action than Buy Now because it's asking for less. This this is some extra advanced copywriting stuff. 
I mean, uh, it's simple, but it's the next level psychology stuff. You don't need to know. You don't need to know why you say add to cart and not buy now, but it's because you're asking for less. Mm -hmm. The less you ask, the easier it is to get. Now, this has been proven. This has been scientifically in a laboratory proven to increase conversions. Uh, I should have provided the statistics. I read it. It was like 13% or something yeah. like that. And when we provide statistics, then you trust us more that what we're telling you in this course. It increases our credibility. Yeah. So just using it in the course. Okay. Copywriting inception. A common mistake that publishers make is giving a weak close such as, this book is for you, or you need this book. Right? These are not specific and not direct call to action. Tell them exactly what to do. Just tell them exactly what to do, what we have here. If you want to, big benefit, then scroll up and click the add to cart button. They literally have to scroll up and then click that exact button, that exact language. So this is copy-paste. Do not change the yeah. words from this There's that we have in bold. There's no doubt in their mind what they need to do. Unless Amazon changes what the button says. They won't. I don't think so. Now here you can see what the Amazon buttons look like and also why your ebook and paperback book descriptions are going to be slightly different. It all is just from the call to action. So here on the left side, we have for paperback books, this is what the buy button looks like. It just says add to cart. Now add to cart and buy now, they both in the end are supposed to lead to a sale, but the statistics, there are numbers that show saying add to cart increases conversions. So with that knowledge, we should put add to cart for all of our call to actions. And then on the right side, we have what the ebook button looks like. So you want to say exactly what that button says. There's no add to cart button. It's buy now with one click. So you tell them, scroll up, click the buy now with one click button to get your book instantly. This is what you say for ebook. These are the only changes that at least I can think of right now between your ebook and paperback. And the reason you write get your book instantly, the reason we don't write it for paperback is because you won't get it instantly. Yeah, you have but to wait did, for shipping. If it did, then I would include that as well because that's just another benefit yeah. of buying right now. Yeah. Right. So quickly to recap what the book description structure looks like, it's just the five part structure that we talked about. Headline, story slash lead, bullet points, dealing with last minute objections, and then the call to action. It's really that simple. Then you can see what the main objective with each one is right here. It says it right there. This one slide contains a lot of powerful information, but this contains the what to do, not how to do it. Yeah. Okay, so you need to watch the rest of the lesson to figure out exactly how to do it. And then finally, we want to end this long lesson, which is getting pretty lengthy now, with two rules. We figure we just throw it in at the end because it is good things to know. So that when you finish writing your description, apply these two rules. So the first one is that you're talking to your reader, not from your own perspective. So maybe you accidentally do this. If you're writing eyes, like I will help you do this, whatever, whatever. Um, turn all of your eyes to use. This can be applied to everything within reasonable doubt that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Most of them. Yeah. Um, and then rule number two is something called the 90% rule is 90% of the times that can be deleted. Yeah. I didn't realize this until you I got it looked pointed at out. it. Until I got it pointed out. So to do this, just click Control F. Or just Command F on Mac, whichever way you do it. Um, and then find all of the places in your description where it says that. Read it. And if it is used unnecessarily, then remove it, which is about 90% of the time. Yeah. Now, there are some times where you, where you can't remove it. That's about the 10%. But it just makes your writing much more clean and less wordy. Yeah. Less words is better when it comes to delivering your message. You just have to get to the point. Yeah, exactly. And then the final slide, we just want to say that you should write your description in Word or Google Docs. That really doesn't matter. And... When you're writing, don't worry about formatting or anything else. Don't worry about making it look nice. Just write a damn good book description that will sell like crazy using everything that we talked about in this lesson. Okay. And there is an in-depth lesson about how to format your book description the best way, which might take you like just as much time as writing yourself mm -hmm. because you have to learn some coding. I don't want to scare you, but... That's just the fact of the matter. Uh, we'll save the rest for that lesson. And we also have an upcoming lesson where we will share a description that we wrote 
it's a great example of a very good book description. Yes. It's, so you can see what it looks like all put together. Yes, it is simply the description for our puppy training book that we wrote following this five-part structure. Yeah. Okay. So this is just how to best and most easily and most effectively break down a book description and write one that will sell like crazy. Yeah. So with all that said, we will see you guys in the next lesson. Have a good day. Goodbye. Goodbye.